Thank you, Abhav. So let me start by you know, thanking the Omaha Azure user group for providing this platform for Azure followers and lovers to come together and discuss about Azure. And uh, you know, I'll be talking about load balancing in Azure today, so really excited to be here amongst all of you. Quickly, let me go through the contents that I wanted to share with all of you today. So introduction, we've already talked a little bit about the introduction of PK. I'll take you know, a few seconds just to quickly introduce myself. Then I'll deep dive into load balancing. And I'll start with, you know, what is the need for load balancing? We'll quickly have a look at the evolution of load balancing, not because I'm a history buff, but you know, I think some of the, the technologies that have been used for some time are still being used today. So we'll have a quick look at the you know, evolution of load balancing. Then we'll see the options that Azure presents to us in terms of load balancing, and then also look at some reference architectures that you know, Microsoft has provided. I think Microsoft has done a great job of you know, documenting that and how, having the architecture diagrams on his website as well. And obviously, you know, we'll save some time for Q&A so that we can have a great discussion. Okay, PK, I'll breeze over the slides since we've already introduced PK. A quick introduction about myself. So I love everything software. Uh, the first time I, you know, uh, laid my hands on a computer and wrote uh, my first program in Logo and then GW Basic, which was, you know, many, many years ago. But I've been a Microsoft fan and advocate and follower since then. Uh, I have also had the opportunity to work with Microsoft as a consultant for 12 plus years. In terms of uh, you know, the expertise that I bring to the table for PK, I'm basically, you know, I specialize in solution architecture, I specialize in Azure, and specialize in app dev, which I've been doing for the longest period of time now. Um, I actually live in Seattle uh, and you know, around 20 miles east of the Redmond campus, the Microsoft Redmond campus, where I've you know, been to work for many years. Uh, in terms of you know what I like like to do in my free time, I love to create things. You know I love to travel. Pre-COVID, uh, you know I would travel quite a bit. And when I talk about you know creating things, uh, you know I love photography. I love, love music and food. Quick fun fact here: this picture that you see of myself, it's a picture that I've taken you know myself. So it's a selfie in that sense, not using my cell phone, but my camera in a home studio, a photography studio that I set up. OK, now let's get into load balancing and understand why we really need it. Uh, so the Internet is getting crowded. Uh, you know, I just pulled up some numbers from from uh, a website. And if you look at the number of Internet users that we had in the year 2000 versus, you know, the number of users that we have now, it's really, really grown a lot. Right. So back in 2000, we have we had roughly what half a billion users less than that. And now, as of yesterday, when I was updating this PPT, we have close to five billion users across the world. And in my nearly 20 year career, any system that I've worked on, be it a desktop application, be it an enterprise wide application, there's one thing that I've constantly heard in every project is we want to make it faster, right? So the traffic is growing, but everybody wants to access their stuff uh, you know, on the internet or on their on-prem networks faster. So I feel that is what is giving you know, rise to load balancing, and we've seen that increase over these years. Let's quickly look at the, the correlation between user satisfaction and page load times. Uh, a, a rough guideline nowadays is if your page is taking more than three seconds to load, it's going to turn users off. They're going to go away from your system. I'm not going to drain each and every circle over here, but uh, you know, I just picked up some data from a website and some anecdotal you know, facts about how if your website or if your system is slow, you're actually losing revenue and you're losing money on that. So you really need to ensure that your systems are able to cater to increasing your you know, user load and are able to be fast as well. So how do we solve this problem? There's, there's you know, a few ways we could do it, right? We can, we, let's talk about vertical scaling. And an analogy that I like to use is, you know, I'm an average build guy. You ask me to lift 50 pounds, I'll probably be able to do it. You ask me to you know, lift 75 pounds, I will probably be able to do that. Uh, you know, I'll even grunt a little bit, but I'll do it. You asked me to, you know, lift 100 pounds. That's when I'll, you know, I'll have to probably exercise. I'll have to muscle up before I can do that, right? And then you keep you raising the bar. You asked me to lift 200 pounds. I have hit my ceiling, right? I cannot muscle up more. I cannot lift that load. So think of vertical scaling like that. You can keep making your systems more powerful in terms of throwing more processing speed, throwing more memory, making the storage faster, making communication faster. But you will hit a hit a vertical ceiling sooner or later. So how do we overcome this problem? So you're asking me to lift 200 pounds more than that. That's when I start calling my friends, right? And then we start dividing the load amongst ourselves. So that's how you know you do horizontal scale, 
right? So this way, what you're doing is you're basically introducing more systems and these systems are able to divide the load and therefore they're able to accomplish much more than what individual systems would have been able to do. Well, that sounds great, but that does bring up some challenges as well, right? When you talk about horizontal scaling, or let me take you back to that analogy of me requesting for my friends, multiple friends maybe, help to lift weight, there needs to be coordination, right? If I'm lifting at the wrong time and you know somebody else is not lifting at that time, then we're not going to be able to achieve what we wanted to do. So there needs to be that coordination. There needs to be some controller that takes care of coordination amongst these multiple resources that are trying to achieve the same objective of lifting more. So that's how, you know, you basically scale up and ensure that you're able to cater to your ever increasing demands of load. And that's what also, you know, got the load balances into the picture as well. So it is the load balances that take care of this coordination, type, that take care of this controlling and allow you to scale horizontally. Okay, so these are the primary drivers that load balancing basically, uh, you know, helps you. Uh, these drivers led to load balancing, you know, basically coming in. This is, these are this is what load balancing helps you do. It allows you to achieve scale. So when I'm talking about scale, it is both scaling up as well as scaling down. You have more and more users coming in. You realize you need to increase your, you know, instances of VMs or services. Scalability allows you to do that. At one point in time, then you might want to reduce the number of resources you're using so that you can, you know, optimize on costs. You don't want to keep spending a whole lot of money even when you don't have a lot of user user load, right? So load balances, load balancing helps you scale. Load balancing helps your systems be reliable. What do we mean by that? Uh, you know, let's say my system is taking maybe three seconds to, uh, you know, turn around or, or load, and tomorrow is taking a lot more time. Right, so then I will say that my system is not reliable. So load balancing allows my system to be reliable. It also allows my systems to be available. So uh, I'm not going to have, you know, let's say if I go and hit my system today and I'm able to access it, but let's say if I try to log in tomorrow, I'm not going to be able to access it, right? So uh, load balancing takes care of availability. So I think it's these three pillars that load balancing really provides solid platforms to be built on. Again, to summarize, scalability and availability and reliability as well, allowing your users a predictable experience every time they're going to your system. Okay, now let's look at uh, look at how load balancing has evolved over the years. We saw how you know the, the network traffic has increased. It's, you know, it requires systems to be better tuned. And then it, it gave birth to these technologies. And let's start with the DNS-based redundancy. So probably this is the simplest form of load balancing. And uh, you know, started many years back. Let me quickly walk you through a, a few details on on how that worked. And actually, some of it is still used, right? We'll see some of it being used in the Azure load balancers um, in Traffic Manager, in fact. So on the left here, you have your client systems, and then you have your DNS server. We all know how DNS works, right? We have a website address. We type it into a browser. You know, it goes to a DNS server, and then we we get an IP address. And basically, the DNS server does the name of the name name resolution. So what what load balancing at the DNS level was doing was that it was returning a set of the IPs of the servers in random order, right? So if you look at the right hand side, you have you know I've, uh, for simplicity simplicity sake, I just have three servers over here. Uh, they have three different IPs. Let's say client one makes a request, it hits the DNS server, and you get the response of the available servers as you know the IP312. Another client that's making a request, it goes and makes a request and it gets a different response from the DNS in the order of 132. So this is the way you know load was being balanced. So client A comes in and is getting redirected to potentially the first one. It gets redirected to this server. Client two comes in, hits the DNS server, and then you know the first entry in the DNS response is one. So it gets routed to this server. So this is you know how how DNS-based redundancy was helping in load balancing. It did have its you know, pros, it did have its cons. The pros were it was very easy to add new systems, right? I add a new system, I add a DNS entry, and then you, know, you can easily scale that system up. Uh, one of the problems here was there was no way of your DNS server pretty much knowing that your system was down until it pinged the, pinged the, the system the next time, right? So you could have a system which was doing well in terms of being able to scale, but in terms of availability, that was a problem. Another problem there was TTL or the time to live for DNS entries, right? Let's say one of my servers went down for whatever reason, and then I came up with another server that had a different IP address. 
We know that DNS caching happens across routers all over the world, and sometimes because of propagation delays, that might take a long time, right? So those were some pros and cons that were seen in this DNS-based redundancy model. So then with the evolution, the next step basically was that you know proprietary software load balancing came in. And basically the concept here was your operating systems or your application level became a little more intelligent in which you know it wasn't simply, okay, you know, I'm getting and I'm getting a response from the same server again. But let me give an example of these three servers. Again, I have three of them here for simplicity's sake. They're obviously listening to their own IPs, so you know, dot one, dot two, dot three, but they're also listening to a cluster IP at the same time. And a client machine, let's say, goes ahead and makes a request. It makes a request to the cluster IP. It doesn't know these individual servers that are there in the cluster, but the OS or the application at this level is able to then respond with one particular server's IP, right? So this is how software load balancing was, you know, being, being taken care of, which was in, in terms of evolution, the next step after DNS-based redundancy. Again, like with everything in, else in life, you have pros and cons here as well. In terms of, you know, pros, the system was highly available. Uh, in terms of the cons, the, the complexity increases, increased tremendously, right? Think of a scenario in which I'm introducing a new server over here. The, the number of communication channels that opens up and grows exponentially, so this solution was not very scalable. So this gave way then to network-based load balancing, where you started seeing the emergence of physical devices which were taking care of network load balancing. And they did this two-way NAT or you know network address translation. So let's again look at an example where there's a client that's trying to get information or trying to hit a web server. So it's going to hit this IP 192.0.0.1. And then this particular network load balancer knows or is abstracting the servers that you have behind it, right? So it's able to do that network address translation both ways, both internal and external. And this way you were able to achieve you know, high availability. Uh, you were able to achieve you know, uh, reliability, and you will, uh, you were able to achieve scalability as well. Additionally, you also had the advantage of probing, right? Because your network load balancer knew which server is going down, so it can take the, take it out of the mix. And when, if that, when and if that server comes back, it was able to get it back to the pool. So this is, you know, how network-based load balancing was was handling things. And then, you know, uh, the evolution continued and came across application delivery controllers. So this is what I would say, uh, you know, what, what what we've been witnessing for the past few years now. And this is becoming more and more sophisticated. You get a lot of, you know, features like SSL offloading uh, that, that you have, that you get through application delivery controllers. Uh, I think also one of the reasons why this slide is important is while we're seeing this evolution, of this DNS space redundancy, then you know software load balancing, then hardware devices coming in, and application delivery controllers coming in. Uh, we'll be touching upon the Azure load balancing mechanisms. These are all used even today, and, and you know even for this topic that we'll be discussing. Okay, now let's look at the anatomy, or you know let's break down a load balancer and see what are the common components that every load balancer has. Right, all load balancers have basically a front end con configuration. This is, think of this as kind of an interface to the external world. And by external, I don't mean only, you know, uh, public IP addresses or internet facing IP addresses, but it could be even your on-prem or, you know, closed setups. Uh, but this is your, you know, the interface to the whole load balance setup that you have. Then you have your backend pool. These are typically the resources that your load balancer is, you know, handling. These could be VMs, these could be containers, these could be services, and we'll touch upon all of them later in more detail. Then an important aspect of load balancer is having, you know, these probes that we've talked about, right? So how does your front end know that, you know, certain resource in the backend pool is unavailable for whatever reason? Maybe it's a server that's gone down, maybe it's a service that's really busy. So, you know, you have these probes, which are an important part of the load balancer, which do these regular checks on the health of each and every resource that you have in your load balanced pool. And then you have the rules engine or the load balancing rules, which basically define where your request should be routed to. And you know, depending on which load balancing mechanism we're talking about, they can vary in their levels of sophistication. Uh, they could be operating at layer four or right up to you know, the application layer at layer seven. But if you look at you know, pretty much all load balancers, they'll have these components when you look under the hood. Okay, moving on to the next slide. 
let's look at the options that Azure provides to us in terms of load balancing, right? Azure provides us with a load balancer, which is basically a layer four load balancer. Uh, it provides us with a traffic manager. Remember, we, we touched upon uh, you know, the DNS-based redundancy, so that's how Azure offers it to us. Then we have the Azure application gateway, and then Azure front door, which is you know, which was geared actually in 2019 May, I think, and is becoming really popular. And it's it's actually pretty interesting. I'll dive deep into each one of these as we move along. Okay, let's look at Azure Load Balancer. So it, it operates at layer four. Uh, which is the you know transport layer at the OSI in the OSI model. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean that you know at this layer, your your network packets are not really being looked into. Uh, it's basically the routing is happening at the TCP UDP level, and you know the load balancer does not have the intelligence to peek into your headers to see what kind of a packet it is. So it's just doing that on layer four. Azure load balancers, they allow you to you know, distribute traffic amongst your healthy virtual machine instances. So again, that probing aspect, right? If for whatever reason, any of your VM, VMs go down, it's able to take them out of the pool and then bring them back if and when they become healthy again. The load balancer can be used in both public or internal instances. You can use it for a setup. In fact, I have a schematic in the next slide. You can use it with a public IP, or you can use it to you know, load balance your internal VMs, which are not exposed onto the internet. And then you know, this is what basically allows your VM scale sets to, to work, right? I'm sure you know, we've worked on VM scale sets. This is one of the options that you, you get when you're configuring your scale set. You could use an Azure load balancer, or the other option that you get there is the application gateway. Okay, I've already talked about it being able to probe the health of your instances. Uh, I think I also did mention that you know the load balancer is global, which means that it is able to operate across regions, and you could have you know re it will work across regions, across zones all over the world. It's not limited to any one particular region as such. It is it does support network address translation. Uh, if you remember the schematic that I was showing earlier, it's able to translate the public IPs uh, into your private IPs and then the other way around. So it, it provides that NAT both ways. Okay, let's look at the schematic. Uh, and frankly speaking, you know, I've just picked it up from the Microsoft website. And earlier, they've done a fantastic job of documenting all of this stuff. And there was not too much value that I could really add to the schematic, so I picked it up. But obviously, at the same time, giving all credit to Microsoft. So let's look at you know the Azure Load Balancer here. I talked about the Azure Load Balancer being you know public as well as internal, right? So let's say I go ahead and set up my load balancer such that it has a public IP, and when people hit that public IP, it will you know load balance across my web tier. This could be my application. This could be my API. You know if I'm hosting that as a web app. And then furthermore, if I want, I can have an internal load balancer which doesn't interact with the world outside of you know, your, your closed network, outside of you know, potentially your, your corporate, and you can do that load balancing here. Okay, I have thrown in the link here as well in case you would like to have a look. Okay, now let's talk about Traffic Manager, which is another option that Azure presents to us in terms of load balancing. So Traffic Manager is basically a DNS-based load traffic balancer. And you know, I take you back to my evolution slide in which you know, I talked about how the DNS would return IP addresses either in a different you know, order or it would return different IP addresses altogether and achieve load balancing in that way. Again, this is a global service. It can you know, be used across regions. The, another good thing about this is that your services don't have to necessarily be in Azure. This could be any public facing IP. It could be an Azure service, it could be another cloud, it could be you know, your own server that you hosted that has a public IP. Your endpoints could be any of those. The one thing that you have to keep in mind is that the endpoint has to be internet facing. Uh, you know, that's a necessity when it comes to the Azure Traffic Manager. It gives you a lot of flexible traffic routing options. So, you know, listing them over here. One is priority. So you can set priority. Let's say if you have, you know, five different endpoints, you can assign priorities in that order uh, so that, you know, traffic will be routed in that way. Uh, it could be weighted where you're saying, OK, I want 20% load on all my five servers, or I want 50% load on the first server, which is really fast. You know, I spend a lot of money, so I want most of my traffic to go there. It could be performance-based, so you know, traffic managers will know which of your endpoints are pinging back the fastest. So it could, you know, be biased towards performance. You can configure it that way. 
Another interesting way it can basically, you know, route your traffic is geographic as well, right? And I think this becomes more and more important because, you know, you have GDPR and all these, uh, you know, privacy rules coming in, right? Uh, and uh, so if you want to, for instance, route traffic coming from Germany to a particular endpoint, you could do that. So I think, you know, it holds tremendous value there. It could be multi-value and multi-value is something that I've already touched upon, right? It can give you, uh, you know, it can return the IP addresses of multiple servers. And for whatever reason, let's say the first IP is not working, your application can build in smart logic to try out the other IP addresses or the other multiple values that your DNS has returned to you. You could also do subnet routing. So let's say if you, you want certain IPs, that traffic only to go to a certain subnet, you can also configure that using traffic manager. And then, you know, geofencing your application users. This is something that I had touched upon when I was talking about the geographic uh, traffic routing options, right? So you can ensure that traffic coming from a certain geography is being routed to certain endpoints. So very useful in that sense. Okay, now let's have a look at the Azure Application Gateway. If you remember, I was talking about the application delivery controller and, you know, the real sophistication coming in. So now we're, we're going towards layer seven. Right till now we were looking at layer four. Now we're looking at layer seven and basically what this means is your load balances can look inside your packets and see what kind of packets they are and then route traffic accordingly. And they're like, you know, really, really sophisticated. Uh, I had, you know, shared with you, they provide multiple advantages. Uh, some of them I have in a subsequent side as well. One of them is SSL offloading. One of them is session affinity. So, you know, this is when the load balances are becoming really, really sophisticated. And Azure Application Gateway is basically your application delivery controller as a service. This is a regional service, so it can operate within VNets, but it cannot operate across regions. And uh, I also talked about VM scale sets, right? So Azure Load Balancer was one of the options that you can use to set up your scale set. And then your application gateway is another option that when you're setting up your VM scale set, you can do that. I think another pretty cool thing that Application Gateway has is the AGIC or the Application Gateway Ingress Controller. Uh, none of the technical discussions nowadays can be complete without uh, discussing Kubernetes and containers, right? So this is how you can basically load balance your Kubernetes clusters. And this is really cool because you, know, it, you don't have to create an extra hop in your data path. And I think it's a really exciting offering. Personally, I haven't worked a whole lot on this, but this is something that I would love to explore further and see how to use it in solution design. Uh, application Gateway also provides a web application firewall or a WAF. So this is what helps your you know, applications uh, be more secure on the internet. In fact, I was talking to one of our clients uh, only last week and they had a pretty interesting scenario where they wanted to prevent bots from using their systems. And this was one of the things that we were discussing. So you can leverage the power of the WAF that Azure has to offer. You know, they have uh, intrusion detection and all that that Microsoft has built over these number of years using AI, ML, and you know, all the good stuff. You can utilize WAF in your, in your solution design using the application gateway. And looking at the schematic here, which I have lifted from the Microsoft website, the URL for which is down there below. So uh, let's say I have contoso.com, which is uh, you know using the application gateway. So the users hit that URL, and then they have the WAF and the load uh, you know, layer seven load balancer here, which they're getting through the application gateway. Now this is the interesting thing here, right? Because this is layer seven, this load balancer can actually look into your packets. It can look at the route. It can look at the path and then it can detect. So you can actually set these configuration rules saying, okay, if the path contains images, I want to redirect my traffic to the image server pool. If the path contains video, I want to redirect it to the video server pool. Similarly, there's you know, many configuration options that you can go ahead and configure. Uh, I would like to highlight the diff, you know, that, that one point again, that application gateway cannot work across regions. It is confined to the region it is working in. Okay, let's have a look at Azure Front Door. And this is, I feel, the most exciting offering when it comes to load balancing options that Microsoft has. So over these years, you know, we've come to love Microsoft for all these services, products that they offer. So over these years, Microsoft has developed this really impressive global edge network, right? 
which they've used for their own infrastructure, which they use for services like Bing, which they use for services like Office 365, even LinkedIn, right? So Microsoft perfected this for many years and they were operating all of these things, all of these services on, uh, you know, something that was internal front door for them and which was their application delivery network as a server. It was their application delivery network at that point in time. And then they said, okay, let's go ahead and open this to the public. Let's go ahead and let people, uh, you know, utilize what Microsoft has developed. Obviously, you know, they've monetized it, so there's a cost associated as well. But this is Microsoft's application delivery network as a service. This infrastructure that they've been using to very successfully support their services over these number of years. Again, it operates in, you know, layer seven, uh, the HTTP, HTTPS layer, where front door can look into your packets and then route them accordingly. It is global, so this is the one big difference between Azure Front Door and uh, you know your your um, application gateway is. Remember, I was telling you that this cannot look across regions, but Azure Front Door can, and it uses the you know BCV configuration or split TCP to improve global connectivity. Uh, one limitation that this has is that you have to ha all your endpoints have to be public IPs. Uh, or publicly resolvable, you know, DNS. It cannot look inside your private VNets, right? So that's the one difference between Azure Front Door and uh, your application gateway here. Uh, there's multiple routing methods that you know Front Door provides, and you know we can certainly touch upon them, uh, time permitting. Uh, but as I'd mentioned earlier, very sophisticated. You can configure multiple ways to route your traffic. Uh, to, you know, to to the endpoints that you want them to be routed to. Um, one interesting thing, and you know, when it comes to solution designing nowadays, is do you use Microsoft CDN? When do you use Azure Front Door? When do you use all the other options also that you know Azure has in terms of load balancing, right? So interestingly. Microsoft, as I was mentioning, has built a strong infrastructure, has these you know, points of presence or POPs that has been using for Microsoft CDN. It is also using the same for Azure Front Door. So I think an interesting question and debate becomes, you know, when should I use CDN or when should I use Azure Front Door? Because Azure Front Door seems to be doing some things that the CDN has been doing, as well as taking care of you know, your dynamic site acceleration as well. Okay, let's look at some of the features that Front Door has to you know, offer. It provides dynamic site acceleration. Now we know about CDN, right? CDN is great when it comes to serving static content. Uh, and the whole you know, fundamental behind CDN is that your static content is living on your edge network closer to where the users are. So it's your st same static content that's getting replicated across these different edge nodes. And that's how you're catering and providing a good experience to your end users. So let's say if I have a user in India, they're able to access that static content faster because you know that content is sitting on an edge device near India. And similarly, if I have a user in Europe, the static content is closer to them, so they can you know get to that content much faster. Dynamic site uh, you know access is not not as straightforward because as we know, dynamic sites have dynamic content; they don't have static content. So how do you take care of you know? Uh, that how do you provide a good end user experience where users are able to access that faster as well. So both Azure CDN as well as Front Door offer dynamic site acceleration is along the entire data path. They are fine tuning this data delivery so that even for your dynamic content that's getting generated faster. Front Door offers TLS or SSL offloading, which is very helpful to web servers. So basically what it does is it terminates your TLS or your SSL packets at the boundary. So once you know the data has traversed the internet, you know hit your load balancer, hit front door, it or you know terminates TLS, TLS over there. So so these packets when they're within your protected network, they can move around much faster. They don't have to be encrypted. That makes you know the jobs of your web servers and your endpoints much easier because they don't have the overhead of all the time in you know decrypting and encrypting again. So Azure Front Door offers you that. It provides you the web application firewall. I touched upon that briefly earlier, so it keeps all the bad guys away from your applications. And you know you can use this mature offering that Microsoft has out of the box. Azure Front Door offers you cookie-based session affinity. Right, so let's say you have uh, you know a session going on, and for whatever reason you've stored at least some of the state of your client, uh, and you know maybe it's in it's in a cookie, right? So if 
the next request is routed to another endpoint, you lose that, right? So you lose that uh, context. So Azure Front Door provides you that cookie-based session affinity where certain traffic can continue to be routed to one server so that if, if at all you're maintaining that state, it can be done. Uh, another good thing about Front Door is it offers you free certificates. So you, if you wish, you can go ahead and use your SSL certificates. You can generate them in Front Door and use them versus having to continue, you know, continue to do it from a third party. It does provide you with URL, uh, you know, path-based routing as well, which I had shown you earlier in this slide. Let's look at the schematic that Microsoft has for Front Door as well. So here's the main difference, right, which I was telling you about. Front Door allows you to work across regions. So you can see now Contoso.com basically hits my edge location, and then depending on what the traffic is, I can set my routing configuration. I can set my routing rules to be sent to different regions. OK, so we walked through you know, four uh, options at Azure Load Balancing. Let me go back to that slide to quickly see them again. You have the Azure Load Balancer. You have the Azure Traffic Manager. You have the Azure Application Gateway and Azure Front Door. Now the question is when you're utilizing solutions, you know, when you're helping your customers or your company come up with good solutions, good load balance solutions, which will provide a consistent experience to end users, which ones do you pick and when do you pick them, right? So again, you know, full marks to Microsoft for, for coming up with, you know, this decision tree or this flow chart where they talk about, you know, different situations. And you simply go ahead, you follow this diagram, and it'll give you the recommendations. I won't, you know, go through all of the paths in the interest of time here. Let me maybe just pick a couple of them, right? So let's say if uh, we're talking about a web application, right? Is your traffic HTTP, HTTPS, which is, you know, is it layer seven or is it lower? If it is not, then you know it's asking you whether it's an internet-facing application. If it is not, then the solution is your Azure Load Balancer. If if let's let's look at this other route here as well. If it is an internet facing application, then we can use Traffic Manager as well as Azure Load Balancer, right? So I've thrown in the URL over here as well. Feel free to you know, visit this at leisure, but I feel that this particular flowchart or decision tree is really going to be helpful when you're designing solutions in case you have not already seen it and have not already used it. Okay, Microsoft also has gone ahead and in its reference architecture, you know, shared some of you know these schematics, how you can build scalable web applications. So let's look at one such uh, diagram here where they've used some of these components. You have Azure AD, you have Azure DNS, and then you know your your system is being hit, and then it can either then your request can either be routed through Azure Front Door, which we've seen is the you know layer seven uh, Azure Load Balancing offering that Microsoft is really proud of. It can then route your request to an app service plan. You can have a queue behind it and then the function app, right? So I would say that this can help you build a scalable web application and you can see your traffic getting routed between front door or Azure CDN. A more sophisticated version of this, if you want more scalability, is you, know, you can see this schematic here. So now we have Azure front door, which is basically distributing traffic across regions, right? So uh, similar, you, know, you have a DNS lookup, you know your request comes to the front door and then depending on either routing or depending on you know how busy your app services are it can route your request to either of these two regions and then uh, you know you can have a function app and then we are seeing that there's a redis cache here which um, i happen to be a big fan of and then there's your application here at the database level right so this is how azure front door is able to take care of a more complex scenario where it's splitting your load uh, you know, based on your configuration rules or, or traffic uh, across multiple regions. Okay, that brings me to an end of the slides that I had, uh, you know, today, end of this, this particular deck. Happy to open the floor for any discussions. I know there's uh, Azure experts here, so if there's anything you want to contribute to this discussion, if there's any questions you want to ask, please feel free to do so. The floor is open. Thanks, Abhishek. Anyone has any questions for Abhishek? I think that the season graph is very, very critical, and it's very important to also remember that uh, at which layer each of these load balancing solutions work. 
Yep, I completely agree with that. Hi, Abhishek. This is Srikanth. Hey, Srikanth. Yeah. Recently, Azure announced a preview for the cross-region support for the load balancer. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you explain that? Is what is the extra benefit for that? We are going for the cross-region load balancer. How it is different for what are the load balancers which are available already in the cross-region, like uh, traffic manager, what you are explaining? Right. So that's a great question. So if you have, you're talking about the Azure load balancer here, right? Yes. Yeah, so if you have that across regions, it, you'll be able to distribute load, let's say across your VMs, uh, across regions as well, right? So then you're not limited to your VMs being within one region. Okay, yeah. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, but is, the, is there any comparison when it, when it is available for the across the regions? Is, mm -hmm. is there any comparison between the other uh, load bearers which are supported for the across the regions? Uh, is there any replace concept or it just is as a role balancer is support for only VMs? I think you, you you should go and refer to that decision graph. Probably it would okay. be helpful because I guess Abhishek is caution is since load balancer now supports cross region. So is it is it like we should just directly go and use load balancer for cross region or how, how should a, we yep, think? Yep. Absolutely. So yes, uh, that's absolutely correct. As we you know, see the point here, Azure Load Balancer is global and it can provide access across regions. The, the best use case for this is when you want to you know, kind of redirect your VM traffic, right? When And because remember this operates at layer four, right? So it's not able to do that smart routing for you, but it's able to see, okay, you know, my this, this VM is busy, so I should start redirecting traffic to the other one. It's again happening at layer four at the TCP or UDP level. It's not able to do that smarter routing. So to the question of when should Azure Load Balancer be used, uh, because this provides, you know, cross region, so does, uh, you know, Traffic Manager, which will provide cross region and, uh, so with your application gateway, right? But when you want to leverage layer seven load balancing, that's where you know you would go to Azure application gateway. Uh, but yeah, this is regional, so this won't be across regions. In that case, you know your front door would be a good option. But again, the difference being between Azure load balancer is because that operates at layer four, and this operates at level seven, layer seven. If you want, uh, you know, only your traffic to be routed depending on, let's say, how busy your VMs are you would stick to your load balancer. If you want more sophisticated routing and the other facilities that front door offers, then you would go ahead with front door. And to WebOps point, you know, this would again help you drive that decision as to which particular solution to use. Yeah, sure, Abhishek, thank you. Thanks. So Absolutely. Much. Anyone feel free to jump in and mute yourself if you want to ask anything to Abhishek around anything around load balancing. Hey Abhishek, uh, thanks for the real basic uh, solid fundamentals. That was very helpful. I, I, I really like the initial analogy, the way you are trying to compare the load balancing things with the, the personal things, right, with the friend. So I had a quick question like, uh, do we have any uh, subtypes in the load balancer? Like in load balancer, like a basic or advanced load balancer? Yeah, in terms of the configuration while you're setting up, uh, for instance, you know, your Azure load balancer has two variations mm -hmm. and the more sophisticated one, I think there's a basic and there's a standard, right? So standard basic will allow you to load balance fewer VMs and, you know, standard will uh, allow you more. Oh, I okay. really have to, I'll really have to go through the different configuration options you have across the other ones. But yeah, that was one that's coming to my mind right away. So oh. load ba load balancer does have two variants. Yeah, I, I was just trying to create a load balancer. I, I, I was seeing some two options over there. <laughs> right, right. So I was just thinking thought of asking. This. Well, one yes, could yes. be basic and standard. And another difference to note here is that internal versus external load balancer as well. Mm -hmm. That is That's correct. Good question, Shiva. Any other questions or any other inputs? Anything that you want to share from your experience on how you've used any of these solutions or how you've come up with solution designs which have made you know solutions more scalable, reliable, available? I 
I think it's a great topic, Abhishek, and uh, the reason is people overlook this is because how Microsoft has packaged their services. Sometimes when we create some of those services in Azure, it automatically creates these load balancers for us. For example, VM scale set, so people don't really realize that what happened in the back end, but it's, it's very good. And it's also, I believe it it is included in uh, few role-based certifications as well. It's a very important topic for Azure administrators and Azure developer exam, as well as the solution architect exam. Okay. I, I don't think there, is, there are any other questions. Uh, on behalf of the user group, I would like to thank you, Abhishek, for taking time out and uh, presenting in the group. This session has been very informative. I believe everyone would have uh, the same opinion. Thank you once again. Absolutely. Thank you again for this opportunity and for everybody for making time to attend.